a line, darn hearing it. So, um, I made one comment tonight and they acted like they just couldn't believe that. Uh, go go over prayer uh, on the praise list. A lot of folks who are traveling are home now. The Martins, the Morrisons, the Masons, uh, several successful surgeries. Ashley Daly Jones. Um, many are doing uh, Janie Creek, Bill Gunner, Jamie Roberts. I actually saw Jamie. Uh, down at camp. I went down to camp briefly yesterday for the board meeting Saturday that I'm not going to be able to be at. Jamie was there and Jamie said he actually feels better than he has in quite a while. Flying issues that caused his trip to the ICU, but it helped them identify the underlying issues and they did. And so he said he's felt better now than he's felt in quite a while. So that's a real answer prayer. Uh, Kristen, uh, Chris Yancey, Sydney Mason, Laney Bradford, uh, recent requests, uh, Seth Wellman, Cody Melder, and we need to add uh, Hallie, right? Hallie's down as well. Um, and uh, James, how's James doing? So he's better, but and uh, Daniel's better. Uh, Tommy Johnson, Jennifer Morrison, uh, Breezy, Sharp, Monica Sharp, Oliver Johnson, Keith Townley, Nathan Johnson. Um, I texted Liz and she said her mom, Carol, is not much changed. Um, so continue praying uh, for her. On. Okay. Good deal. Uh, Linda Starks, Charles LeBlanc. Uh, Matthew Roberts, Carl Chalette, uh, be praying for those on the continuing list. I believe, was it, when are they doing the surgery on Sheila? Or they already did it? Tomorrow or Friday, this week, right? Uh, they're going to try to remove the legion. Uh, they called it a tumor, actually, right? Yeah, Raj called it a tumor in the, the group message, but they're going to try to remove Sheila Richmond's tumor that she has on her brain. So be praying for them. They're down there in New Orleans right now. Um, be praying for those deployed in the military. Um, cancer patients, uh, we've got several, uh, be praying for Carl, um, and Miss Lydia, uh, those traveling, um, Matt Martin, Junior's boy, uh, is, I think he's in Belgium, somewhere over there in Europe with P and G, um, uh, and then he's going to stop by and see their family that they've got in England, you know, his grandma was from England, so, um, he's going to be gone for a couple of weeks, uh, also, uh, Charlene and, and Jack, uh, headed down there to, um, Florida, uh, you can put us on the list. We're going to. Um, uh, the Fullers are back. And then uh, also uh, uh, Mac and his family are gone. Uh, Carol and Todd were gone to Texas, but I think they're back as well. And um, the Johnsons just mentioned Liz. They're up there with her mom in Missouri. And uh, Robert Johnson, he's... Um, Getting close to being done, I think. And I want to say she she was telling me his next spot is it's either the next one or the one after that. He, she said he's got pretty much all his spots he's going lined out for the rest of the year. But I think here coming up soon is uh, Montana, so he'll be pretty soon, and then and then be going to Montana. But I think she said they're going to try to work a family trip into that on the back end, like they're going to go up there and see that parks um, and stuff. So, uh, but right. Now, uh, down south Louisiana. So hopefully he'll be home soon. Uh, he's been gone now, I think, but he's close enough. They either get to go down there and visit him on the weekend or he gets to come back on the weekend. So that that's nice. Um, also, we're praying for those who have lost love. Bill Stimel, Nancy Perkins. Wayne Stimel, uh, Nancy Perkins, Roanne Ballio. Uh, William Cash Jr., Jackie Woods, Geneva North. Is there anything we need to add or any updates to be made? Last name? All right, Wyatt Pacello uh, broke some bones. 
football practice. Anybody else? Good. And Michelle goes here soon, huh? Today. Okay. <clears throat> All right, we're going to sing a few uh, songs with uh, 218. Since we're talking about redeemers, uh, kind of Naomi's story kind of um, comes to its fruition, completion, uh, with the resolution of who the redeemer will be. Uh, I picked a couple songs that kind of go with that because, uh, you know, there's a cosmic redeemer. Uh, it's just specific to... Um, to a couple of women like Ruth and Naomi, there's a redeemer uh, that serves as a redeemer for all of us. And so I tried to choose uh, with that idea. Uh, 218 is the first one. 218, I know that my redeemer lives. <clears throat> I know that my redeemer lives and ever prays for me. I know Sorrow free. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. He wills that I should wholly be in word and thought. Indeed, then I his holy face may see when from this earth life breed. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that. Redeemer lives. I know unto sinful men his says is nigh. I know that he will come again to take me home on high. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal life he gives. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. that over yonder stands a place prepared for me. A home, a house not made with hands, most wonderful I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. I know, I know eternal gifts. I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. 438. 438. I'll sing that one in just a minute. But first I want to read to you from Luke chapter 1, uh, verses 46 through 55. And uh, the calendar that we go through, through, starting around Labor Day through Memorial Day, that kind of swath, if you will, hitting high points as it goes. And the series that we do during the, like Ruth, that we're going to do First Peter, uh, all of that's laid out in terms of the scripture passages and the Bible that put together something called the narrative lectionary. It's just a series of readings that, like, lectionary just means three, goes through its run. I say all this, they've done something interestingly uh, interesting today. They paired Luke 1, the Magnificat, with this story of Ruth and the culmination of her story. And of course, she gives birth to Obed, who will then have Jesse, who will then have David. And and to me, it, it's a it, it seems kind of I guess I don't want to say odd, but when I when I read through what Mary says, 
I thought, man, this could really apply to Ruth uh, in a way because of the theme that Mary talks about within this passage about God taking the humble. I mean, you don't get much humble than a foreign widow that doesn't have any connections, right? God taking the humble and exalting them and using them. Uh, and so I was thinking, man, kind of surprised I never thought about how uh, Ruth's story really is reflected in what Mary says. Um, Typically, when we look at the Magnificat, we pair it with what Hannah says, uh, Hannah's song, when she when she learns that she's going to give birth uh, to Samuel, uh, she glorifies God in much the same way Mary does. And so I think I've always kind of associated those two, but you really can, I think, read the Magnificat as we're about to do and think about Ruth. And, and there is a lot of um, points of connection between what Mary sings and her praise to God and, and what you could also say about Mary. So uh, the Magnificat, Luke uh, chapter 1, beginning in verse 46. And Mary said, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit in God my Savior. For he has had regard for the humble state of his bondservant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me. For the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy for generation toward those who fear him. He has done mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who were proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down rulers from their thrones and exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty handed. He has given help to his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, just as he fathers to Abraham and his descendants and so if you just go through that uh, you know Mary talking about how her soul exalts the Lord her spirit has rejoiced in God her Savior for he has regarded the humble state of his bond servant on all generations will call me blessed y'all we're studying because her story is one that is significant and, and there's a beauty to her story and when you read her story, you can't help but say this woman. And when Mary talks about how God has come um, to her, he has done mighty deeds with his arm. His mercy is to generation after generation toward those who fear. Mary sing it, but I think about Ruth's statement. Your God will be my God. She clearly had a fear of the God of Israel, a reverence for the God of Israel, to leave her own gods towards the God of Israel with Naomi. Um, he's exalted those who are humble. He's filled the hungry with good. Naomi and Elimelech went to Moab because there was no bread in Bethlehem. And then Ruth returned to Israel because that's their some sense of security. And God fills them with these good things, not only giving them the physical life, but incorporating them into this this cosmic story. How God's going to redeem all of creation and it says he's given help to his servant remembrance of his mercy think about it naomi and elimelech leave him, and I've, I've mentioned this a few times already in this series there was no king in israel and everyone did what was right in his own eyes and now here comes ruth and naomi back to israel and within a few generations we're going to see david rise up the paragon of of kingship for israel and so it's not just that God has helped Ruth and Naomi. In his helping them, he is indeed, as Mary sings, giving help. And so I was just really intrigued by um, the people who put the lectionary together and this this passage, uh, these calendars that have all these passages, because uh, I, I never would have thought to, to associate the Magnificat and Ruth's story. But man, there are some strong similarities uh, between those two. Well, we're going to sing one more song before we uh, go to God in prayer. Uh, 438, uh, Redeemed. <clears throat> redeemed, hey, hey, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed through his infinite mercy. Forever I am. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed of the Lamb. Redeemed, is shrouded forever, redeemed and so happy in Jesus. 
us. No language by rapture can I know that the light of his presence with me does continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. I know I shall see in his beauty, in whose Oh, I delight, guarded my footsteps, and giveth me songs in my redeemed, redeemed, redeemed of the land, redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever. Do you want to go ahead and mark one thing? Uh, one, we'll sing that one after. <clears throat> Lesson uh, this evening. Uh, let's before we get into the final chapter of Ruth. Father, we come before you. We do praise you for the fact, that, Father. We we love to claim the fact that we are redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And Father, despite all the mistakes that we've made in your sight, you've chosen to value us and love us despite who we are at our worst. Father, you see potential in us, the ability with the help of your spirit to become more like your son, Jesus. And so we're grateful for your mercy and your grace. Father, we're grateful for that spirit which helps us be better than we ever could. We're grateful for the sacrifice of Jesus, which made it possible. Father, we continue to to ponder the mysteries of how you have been. We think about how so often history, maybe it doesn't repeat itself, but in similar ways, Father, even thinking about what you did through the life of Ruth, through the life of Mary, Jesus' mother, and, and how you always use the humble, Father, for the humble submit themselves to you as, as their, your servant. Father, and you're using the humble, you show us that our strength or our might that these things are achieved. But it's through your work, through your divine will. And we're so grateful, Father, for all the ways that you have worked in history. Father, to bring about our redemption. Father, we're grateful for the blessings of this life. You have given us so many things that we so often take for granted. Father, we live in a world that encourages us to look at what we don't have rather than count our blessings. And Father, I pray that you'll help us to, to make that a spiritual discipline every day, to just ponder all the ways that you've blessed us, all the things that you've given us, your goodness towards us. Father, we're grateful for the answer prayers. There are many on our list who are better home, who are back home safely from their travels. Father, we lift up to you those who are continuing to struggle with illness. Father, we think about uh, the many on our list who are ill right now. We think of Cody and Hallie and uh, Seth and, and uh, Wyatt, those who have been added here recently, kind of Jennifer. We think of those who continue to battle uh, chronic illnesses. Father, we ask your, your blessings upon her with her surgery that's coming up. We pray that you'll use the doctors and the, the nurses uh, to bring about healing and the restoration of her health. Mindful of Carl, and we pray that you'll be with his family and with Lydia. As they try to minister to him, him with his illness, Father, we pray for those. COVID is is raising its head again, and it's going through our communities. And we pray that you will watch over those who are especially vulnerable, uh, the elderly, the sick, uh, those who are in the nursing homes. We pray that you'll be with those who minister to them. Father, we pray for all traveling. Father, so often we take for granted the, the safety that we enjoy when we travel but father we know that you're watching over us and we're grateful for that for the protection that you offer us father we pray for those who have lost loved ones we pray for the Stimel family the Per family the family of William Cash Jr. The Norsworthy family father all others who are because of the loss of their loved ones father we pray for our world there's so much darkness Father, all we have to do is turn on the television and we see places where 
there's war, there's loss of life. We see places where there's famine, there's want. Father, we see the great evil that's often perpetrated by humans against other humans. Father, it can be so discouraging. Father, help us to, to remember that ultimately you will make all things well. Despite all the things that we see, Father, the victory has already been won at the cross of Christ. So, Father, help us put our, our hope in that. Help us put our, our faith in that, knowing that you already have won the victory and the war will be won because of what you have done. Father, bless our time this evening as we study your word, as we consider how you use someone like Ruth and her faith and her loyalty, <coughs> someone like Boaz and his generosity and his obedience to your will, your law. Father, we're grateful for these people and the example they are to us, Father, showing how simple people who choose to be obedient, who choose to have faith, can be used in mighty ways by you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so last chapter of Ruth. Um, most of you probably know how it ends. Um, Ruth chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. It says, Now Boaz went down there, and behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz spoke was passing by. So he said, Come over here, friend. Sit down here. And he came over and sat down. Then he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. So they sat down. And he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who is returned from the land of Moab, has to sell the plot of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. So I thought that I would inform you, saying, buy it before those who are sitting here and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if not, tell me so that I may know, for there is no one except you to redeem it. And I am after you. And he said, then Boaz said, on the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also invite us, the widow of the deceased, in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance. Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, otherwise I would jeopardize my own inheritance. Redeem it for yourself. You may have my right of redemption since I cannot redeem it. Now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning the redemption and the exchange of land to confirm any matter. A man removed his sandal and gave it to another and this was the way of confirmation in Israel. So the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for your sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders of all the people, you are witnesses today that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and Malon. Furthermore, I have acquired Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, to be my wife in order to raise up the name of the deceased on his inheritance, so that the name of the deceased will not be eliminated from his brothers or from the court of his birthplace. You are witnesses today. And all the people who were in the court and the elders said, We are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your home like Rachel and Leah, both of whom built the house of Israel. And may you achieve wealth and Epaphrath and become famous in Bethlehem. Moreover, may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, through the descendants whom the Lord will give you by this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife. And he had relations with her, and the Lord enabled her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed is the Lord who has not left you without a redeemer today, and may his name become famous in Israel. May he also be to you one who restores life and for your daughter-in-law who loves you and is better to you than seven sons has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and named his nurse. And the neighbor women gave him a name, saying, Born to Naomi. So they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. And Ram fathered Abinadab. And Abinadab fathered Nashon. And Nashon fathered Salmon. And Salmon fathered Boaz, and Boaz fathered Obed, and Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. All right, so, first of all, uh, these initial proceedings, that, that look like anything y'all ever done? 
Any of y'all ever bought any land with a sandal? Um, if you see somebody trying to steal your sandal off your front porch, you'll know they're trying to set you up, trying to say that you gave them the right to inherit it. So make sure you take your shoes off inside and lock your front door so no one's going to uh, – I mean, it, it seems odd. I mean, doesn't it seem odd to y'all? I mean, you know, I, I'm sitting here wondering, was this guy going to walk home with one foot? I mean, well, I mean, I'm guessing the shoe gets returned to him, but it's like a uh, a symbolic gesture, if you will. It, it's kind of like being a notary public, it seems. Like, if Boaz had just gone to this guy and said, hey, do you want the right of redemption? He's like, nah, you take it. And then later on, the guy decides, oh, I do want it. Then... He might be able to say, even though it wouldn't be true, well, Boaz never informed me. Think about it. Uh, when someone dies and they're clearing the title and everything, you got to post it in the paper, right? You got to make the announcement so that any possible heirs, any possible claimants are notified that the land has become vacant, that they might have. So Boaz does what would have been common. He takes the guy he needs to do the business with. And he assembles 10 of the elders, uh, which probably just means the head of households from that area. And they all sit down. And so he's got 10 people that have witnessed this transaction, that have witnessed this. And we don't know the guy's name. The one guy that was ahead of him in line for the right of redemption, 10 people have witnessed the fact that he's decided to turn it down. So the guy can't come back on him later and say, well, I didn't ever know anything about it. It should have been mine. 10 people have seen this. And just to clarify, he handed his sandal over, which apparently, and apparently whenever this book was finally written about Ruth, they must not be handing sandals around anymore. Because you notice what it said in verse 7? Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel. It makes it seem like when whoever would have written this down at first, the people that would have swapped in sandals, like it would have been odd to them, right? And I'm sure there are things used to do a couple hundred years ago or however long that would seem odd to us now um, that would have to be explained. And so this book probably wasn't written that long afterward, but clearly I guess they'd said, hey, there's a better way to do this than have to walk home with one one shoe. Uh, well, it seems like what he says is uh, bought from the hand of Naomi. All that. So the redeemer, the guy that Boaz is talking to, he gets first right at buying it. And if he doesn't want to buy it, then he has to publicly renounce his claim of swappings about. He's, he's publicly saying, I don't want it. And so symbolizing that is, here's my shoe. And so they hand the shoe over. So then, since he's renounced it, then it comes to Boaz, who, I mean, because it does say there, well, I had it, but then I'll. Lost it. Um, wait, say what? It meant a little different, right? You're about to inherit something, but it was. <laughs> what? There a novel, Inherit the Wind, or something? I never read it, but it. Okay. Here's the thing, and and you see this happen, and there's. There's another story that I'm hesitant to point you back towards in terms of live a right marriage, um, but but they mention it in this. They mention Tamar, um, Judah's sons. One of them steps up to help his sister-in-law have a child, but he he doesn't want to jeopardize his inheritance either. And there's some stuff that happens, and I'll just let you read that. It's Genesis 38, 39, somewhere around there. And the Lord strikes him dead because of it. Because here's the thing: if he marries Ruth, and has kids by her, then all of a sudden there's more more people to claim whatever his inheritance is, and it, it becomes, um, I'll put it this way, and when it comes to inheriting your, your parents' possessions, would you rather have one sibling or four? You'd rather have one, because then you're getting 50-50. And if he starts having more kids, um, then, and actually theoretically what would happen is, if, I, if memory serves correctly, it would be, so when Boaz has this child, the child would actually be an heir to Malon and Chilion and Elimelech's land. So he's really raising up a child for Elimelech, his brother and stuff. Now, it's not said, maybe Boaz has already had children. I don't know. But clearly the first redeemer 
that they go to, he's worried about lineage and who the land will go to. And I don't know, we've all heard stories about, you know, daddy had two wives and he had the, the second wife, his kids got all the stuff and the first wife's kids got nothing in, in store or vice versa. So I, I don't know exactly the, the mechanics of it, but it clearly would muddy things and uh, possibly disperse things a little bit. So he wants to keep everything clear. Uh, I'm trying to remember if there's another place. I mean, it, maybe it's just because I've read the story enough to where it doesn't seem odd to me anymore. Um, but there might be. Um, I, I know, because at first, you notice what Boaz does. He says, hey, there's this land over here. And he says, oh, okay, I'll take some land. Because that would add to what he would pass down. But when he realizes the land comes with Ruth and that he would be expected to marry Ruth and then Ruth would have children who the land would go to, that, that's probably the clearest way to say it. By marrying Ruth and having kids by her, those kids would then be heirs rather than him to that land. If it was just the land, he'd have taken it because then he could have had it. But when he hears that there's a, a wife involved that could have kids that would cut off his ability, because all, all he seems to be interested in is the land. Um, one commentator said, uh, he seems to remember he has a business appointment when a wife comes up and says, oh, no, can't do it. Sorry, got to go. Got, oh, oh, look at that. I'm running late for my dentist appointment. It's yours. Here you go. Here's my sandal. <laughs> Bye. Uh, uh, well, and it, and it could be, his, he might say, I cannot, but he might mean will not. Um, I mean, that's the thing. It might not be, he might, he might have been free and clear to be able to, but he might be looking at his portfolio of land and saying, well, hold on. I thought at first I was going to get to add to my portfolio. Now I'm getting mouths to feed and I'm not going to get to add any, any acres. So no, forget that. No pass. Um, kind of reminds me when you go around the monopoly board and you're like, what's the rent on that? No, never mind. Uh, uh, you can, someone else can take that. I don't want it. And so it devolves to Boaz who you got to admire Boaz knows exactly how to, I mean, we saw at the end of Ruth three, he basically tells her, I'll handle this. Let me go to the city gate where all the business is handled. Let me talk to the redeemer. I'll handle it. it you, the way it's written, I kind of read between the lines that Boaz already has this plan. Like he knows, all right, get him, get him interested in the land, then hit him with the fact that, oh, by the way, Ruth comes with it. And it, to me, it just doubles back to what we've talked about, a theme that kind of runs through this. Like Boaz, apparently, from what we're reading, is taking on the responsibility of a family and possibly children. And he himself will not stand as the heir to the land. He buys it, but the land will go to his chil his children, but it won't go to him directly. But what's interesting is what does become his is a spot in the lineage of David. Like his his acting selflessly through the whole story leads him to be in the royal family tree. Now it, uh, it's interesting if you could have gone back and told the guy, oh by the way, you're in the royal line if you do this. Okay, uh, uh, you know, like when he thinks it's just about the land, he's interested. When he realizes there's a woman involved, he's not interested. But your name will be remembered forever. He probably would have been interested again. But we never know these things in advance. Boaz is just acting based on his responsibilities and what he's supposed to do. This redeemer is not. He's just, from what I can tell, self-interested. Um, and so we don't even know his name. Whereas Boaz's name, we do know. Ruth's name, we know. Obed's name, we know. Jesse's name, we know. David's name, we know. And so it just goes to show you that there's been this consistent theme, I think, in the story about God uses and rewards towards loyalty and faith and obedience. Now, how have the circumstances changed since the beginning of the story? When you look at the end of Ruth 4, how have things changed? So a lot... That's very nice, because we're going to come back to that when we look at it through name. Naomi's perspective. Well, always... Um, but, okay, when you think about the beginning, 
The one consistent thread is actually Naomi. Naomi's the only one at the beginning of the story and at the end. It starts off with Elimelech, Naomi, Malon, Chilion. At the end of the story, it's Naomi, Ruth, Boaz, then they have Obed. But so Naomi's been there. At the beginning of the story, she's fleeing Bethlehem because there's no bread. By the end of the story, her daughter-in-law, who's also a widow herself, has found love at the threshing floor where there's an abundance of barley and grain and now there's an abundance of bread. And whereas before Naomi had no grandchildren, now she has a grandchild. Um, there, obviously Naomi wasn't barren; she had two sons. Did you read what it said there towards the end? Um, uh, verse thirteen, and the Lord enabled her her to conceive, and she gave birth to a son. She had no child with Balaam, but she has a child with Boaz. And, and the, the, the text explicitly says the Lord enabled her, which to me implies that there might have been an issue in terms of barrenness. Wouldn't be the first time God has used someone that was barren. Uh, I mean, go down the line. Sarah. Uh, well, it mentions uh, Rachel. Now, remember, with the she be like Rachel? And at first I'm like, like, Rachel? Rachel was barren for a while. But, but between Rachel and Leah, they don't mention Bill and Zilpah. But uh, the 12 tribes tribes of Israel uh, are, are raised up. And so um, indication that God, it's not just that God has kind of providentially been acting. There's kind of an insinuation that he's, that for some reason she was not able to have children before, but now she has. Uh, so there's been a lot of changing. Uh, it's funny how Naomi's story has gone full circle, if you think about it. She's right back where she began. But she has experienced so much and she's learned so much about who God is. Like she's had moments where we'll go ahead and open this this can, Bo. Uh, she's had moments where she says, call me Mara, for the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. She's had those moments in life, but she's also now experiencing great joy. And so to me, you could almost name the story Naomi uh, because Naomi's as much a character as Ruth. Of course, Ruth's loyalty is, is one of the big themes. So I understand why it's called Ruth. But. Man, Naomi's got an interesting perspective, I think. Like, I wonder if she's sitting there reflecting on the fact that um, everything she's been through um, and everything she's experienced, uh, it kind of reminds me, uh, anybody, ain't got any Lonesome Dove fans in here? Y'all see, I've seen the movie, right? One of my dad's here today. He like, yeah, the, what's the, uh, which one is it? Gus? Is Gus the one that, uh, who dies? Woodrow? <laughs> Gus dies, right? Anyway, Woodrow's sitting there and he's daydreaming about everything that's happened. He's got this like vision and all these memories come flooding back. And I kind of think maybe that's what Naomi's doing here. Now, of course, there's a big difference. They start off in Texas and end up in like Montana. And Naomi's gone full circle, right? But that, that idea that towards the end of the movie where Woodrow was sitting there and he's just having all these flashbacks of everything they've experienced, right? The whole trip from Texas to Montana and Indian attacks and all this other stuff, um, the friendships, all that stuff comes flooding into his mind. I can see Naomi sitting there rocking little Obed and just thinking about the trip from Bethlehem to Moab and transpired. Uh, all these events, I can, I can see her standing by the grave of Elimelech and then Malon and Chilion and she's remembering all these nights she probably cried herself to sleep and then here she is holding Obed. And I mean, her journey, there's, there's a realism to the Bible, y'all. Uh, people like to like portray it like some type of fantasy fairy tale no there's a realism to the bible like the bible doesn't pull any punches the bible doesn't make it sound like everything's always just hunky dory for people like she's she's been through it i mean she's seen a lot witnessed a lot suffered a lot but here she is at the end in a moment of just pure joy uh, and everyone recognizes i mean even just the short time from when she came back and we talked about the fact there were five people like hey there's naomi they never should have left huh and now they're all talking about how blessed she is. Just that short period of time, how her life um, has been transformed. Um, now, as we, as we close, how does God use this story to achieve a bigger purpose? I mean, all you got to do is look at the last couple of verses, right? We're a few generations away from what? David, right? Obed, the child that's born, will be the grandfather of David. And, and again, I mentioned this earlier, it's not just Ruth. And Naomi, who God is helping here. Like a story that begins 
uh, on the heels of judges in a time of anarchy and chaos and everybody doing what they want to do. Now we're seeing that this, the stage has been set for the birth of David. Uh, even under Saul's reign, there was a still a touch of anarchy going on. I mean, who is it that ultimately unifies the kingdom? David. Uh, David is the one that captures Jebus. Uh, they rename it Jerusalem, makes the arrangements at least for the building of the temple. Like all these things that have been kind of unsettled in a way, David is going to be the one that comes and despite his faults, let's be clear, despite his faults, he's the one that kind of comes and gets everything uh, stable, at least for a little while. Until Solomon comes and finds ways to mess it up a little bit. And then Rehoboam really says, well, you think you messed it up? Watch what I can do. And uh, But David is like the pinnacle. And the stage is set for David. So it's not just Naomi. It's not just Ruth. It's not just Boaz. It's all of Israel that's going to be blessed through these people's story. And then take it one step further. Not just all of Israel. All of us. Like God uses the story that we've been talking about the last few weeks to directly impact us. Um, because go back to what we read at the beginning there, the Magnificat is able to sing that song in part because of Ruth and Naomi and Boaz's story. Now, could God have done it another way? I mean, I'm sure there's also say, you know, like the, like, like the initial redeemer, eh, and then they just recede from history. But it's people that are loyal, it's the people that have faith, that choose the God of Israel, it's the people that are obedient to God's will and God's law like Boaz. They're the ones that are written into the story. Now, written, well, I can promise you, we're not going to be written into the story of the Bible in a while now, but God's still writing a story. I mean, there's still a story of what God is doing. Um, and so we can still be part of God's story, even if it's not the canonical biblical story. And hey, our name, they might not be studying us years from now like we're studying Ruth. But if our story and the decisions we make and the, the way that we choose loyalty and faith and obedience blesses other people, the way that Ruth and Naomi and Boaz's story blessed other people, then I'm OK with that. Like, I, I'm fine if I'm not famous, but I want my story and my decision uh, to choose faith and obedience to be a blessing of us. Uh, any comments as we kind of wrap up? I think Paul would be astounded. Well, he knows. But if you had told guess what? You're right in scripture. He said, What? Um, I mean, I don't think when he sat down to write Romans, he was like, they're gonna need some sound theology. So, I mean, we forget, like, so much of what God uses is the everyday. He was writing to a church he'd never been to before, trying to lay out the basics, his understanding of the gospel, and God was in years. Uh, because the thing is, sometimes we don't know when we're being used. Like, he didn't know the Spirit was guiding him in the way that it was guiding him. And we're guiding us until hindsight shows us. But you're right. I think nowadays Christians, I'll throw pastors and preachers in there, they're chasing celebrity. But when you look at the Bible, those people aren't chasing celebrity. They were chasing God and faithfulness. And now they, they became famous for the ways that they were faithful. But most of the people that we read about, they were not trying to be famous. They were just trying to do what I wanted them to do. And it was preserved with simple obedience. And man, man, that might be a day because the world tells you, Oh, you got to be rich. You got to get likes and followers and be rich and all this other stuff. Um, when I come, <laughs> excuse me, when I come back, the Sunday when I come back, the passage that I'm going to be preaching on is the rich man and how he's so focused on amassing his riches and building bigger barns. And you know, he thinks about that passage that says, uh, "Eat, drink, and be merry," but he forgets about the part that says, "For tomorrow we die." You know, a, the world tells us to chase a lot of uh, one iota. Eternal. It don't matter how much money's in your bank or you got on Instagram or how popular you were or what your seat in government. None of that stuff matters eternal. There's a reason why Paul talks about all the things he had is rubbish. Um, and that's what I remember just a few weeks ago. And Luke, you remember what I've talked about, huh? Uh, 
When, when Jesus says, they're like, oh, we're controlling the spirits. And he says, don't rejoice on that. Rejoice that your name is written in the book of life. And that's the thing that we need to, to rejoice in. Before we uh, pray the Lord's Prayer together, one one fifty nine. I gave my life for thee. Um, and uh, the fact that this song ends each verse with a question. Um, it invites us to ponder. Uh, and so that's what I'd invite us to do is really pay attention to those questions that we're being asked. Uh, 159, I gave my life for thee. I gave my life for thee, my precious blood I shed, that thou my ransom be.